And the Ukrainian government awarded, gave, gave a posthumous award to this guy? Yeah, so the uh, former president of Ukraine, uh, Viktor Yushchenko, in 2010, when? gave in the 2010. award to, the, to him. And he was the Ukraine's real first pro-Western president. So the first pro-Western president <laughs> celebrates a Nazi, which right. is not exactly wonderful PR. But also, what does that tell you about... But then again, you also see this country that has elected a Jewish president, right. a Jewish vice president, that Zelensky is... I mean, one can imagine a less likely force for neo-Nazism <laughs> than this Jewish comedian, yeah. essentially. Right. So how do we make sense of that? Is it just this historical legacy that just happens to be there? What, to what extent does Azov still operate? And how, what, is, what does Zelensky know about this particular element in his own armed forces? So after the uh, initial war in Ukraine, so when Crimea was surrendered bloodlessly, and uh, the Russians were making rapid advances in Donetsk and Luhansk, and there were concerns about movement into Donbass. It looked as if the uh, the SBU, which is the intelligence services of, of Ukraine, and the Ukrainian military were effectively kind of uh, almost uh, stabbing the country in the back, if you will, if you want to borrow that controversial expression, or kind of just like, you know, not really uh, resisting firmly enough. So these kind of ultra-nationalist Ukrainian nationalist battalions started propping up and forming to resist Russia and to use much more brutal tactics, including war crime, borderline war crime tactics, to resist the Russians. The largest was the Azov Battalion, and there were other smaller ones like the Idar Battalion as well. The Azov Battalion is the one that seems to have the most enduring influence, and it is continuing to feature in the in, in Mariupol. We're seeing it in uh, uh, Volnavka. We're seeing it even uh, we're seeing it act as a strong uh, resistance force. Not all of its members are neo-Nazis, at least according to some of their spokespeople. Maybe only 20% of them are, or maybe a bit more than that. But there certainly is a far-right militia, militia element to it, and a sizable contingent, at the very least, of people who were incontrovertibly neo-Nazis. So these battalions were created for that purpose. And part of the reason why the, the Ukrainian state co-ops them, instead of cracks down on them, is because these are nationalists with a lot of arms and with a lot of potential combat uh, readiness and capability. So one, it would be a loss for the Ukrainian military. And two, if these battalions turn against the government, precisely at a time when the Russians are invading and they're squabbling amongst people with guns inside Ukraine, you'll have a much bigger problem. So that's probably why Zelensky turns a, a blind eye to them. But actually, there's very little popular support inside Ukraine for this kind of extreme right. There were members uh, of right sector, which is a right, far right wing party at Euromaidan. But when it comes to the elections, they don't even make the uh, threshold for, for, for seat, seat earning, you know, less than 5%. And also, there was a recent poll that was conducted of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and their popularity. And th some of these anti-Semitic conspiracies were believed by 13% of Russians and just 5% of Ukrainians. So there's arguably more anti-Semitism and far-right nationalism and neo-Nazism inside Russia than there is inside Ukraine. 